Happy New Year. Great to see you. Um, let me just add my welcome to CES. As Bob mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about the economy that we live in today, the data economy, and the way in which it's transforming businesses in profound ways. One of the behind-the-scenes forces that makes the data economy happen is, of course, the data center. And Intel technology has been at the heart of the data center for decades. Over the last few years, we've been investing to expand from the central data center to the network, to the edge, to every person on the planet, across every industry imaginable. And I'll take you through just a few examples of that today. And I wanted to start in the first example uh, in intelligence transforming the way we experience entertainment. Just 10 years or so ago, uh, most of us had ca cable or satellite TV, and many of us would head on a Friday night to the local video store and rent a movie. Fast forward to today, and I don't know about you, over the holidays, we could binge watch just about anything we wanted, any number of TV shows, movies, and user-generated content through streaming services. In fact, the creation, consumption, and transmission of video represents about 80% of internet traffic around the world. And as more people cut the cord and 4K and 8K services combined with 5G with higher bandwidth and lower latency, I expect, we expect that video will continue to be the killer app of the internet for a long time to come. Now, one of the most recognizable names in video content delivery, of course, is Netflix. Last year, Intel and Netflix announced a collaboration for our next generation open source encoding and decoding technology optimized for second generation Xeon scalable processors. This is incredibly important to ensure that the quality and the cost of these services continues to improve. To share more on the partnership that we have with Netflix, I'd like to welcome Netflix's director of encoding technologies and one of Forbes' top 50 women in technology, Ann Aaron, to the stage. Welcome, Anne. Hi. So technology innovation has been helping Netflix obviously transform for many years, and you've been busy expanding your, your uh, reach to all corners of the world. How have you been at Netflix able to navigate through these changes and still remain successful? Well, at Netflix, we only do one thing, entertainment. And we aim to do it really well. We live and breathe TV and films, we want everyone to enjoy them too, whether it's an easy escape or something that provokes debate. We're also obsessed with improving the consumer experience, whether that's no ads, complete control over when you watch and how you watch, better discovery, more enhanced sound and picture quality, or even pioneering new formats like interactive TV. And today, we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. We know that if we stay focused on consumers, we're confident that more people in more countries will choose Netflix for their entertainment. So what role do the technologies that we announced together last year, the video codex, play in your ability to continue to enhance the consumer experience, Anne? Yeah, Naveen, video codecs are a crucial innovation that helped deliver a better experience for Netflix members. It's important now and also into the future because, because it enables better streaming quality at lower bit rates. That means we can, we can send smaller files without compromising video quality. With better compression technology, we can offer more efficient services within, with existing infrastructure. And, and so where is the industry headed then with regard to more efficient codecs over time? The industry collaboration on the royalty-free codec AV1 has delivered up to 60% better compression efficiency over the legacy codec AVC and is posed for notable adoption this, starting this year. Now, the collaboration we announced, um, can you speak a little bit to the business transformation that you expect to see? Because this one was about the sort of next generation of AV1. We call it SVT AV1, or Scalable Video Technology AV1. Can you talk, talk more about what you see there? 
That's right. Uh, when we were looking at the AV1 ecosystem, we realized that there was a need for a clean reference encoder that could be used by developers today, as well as could serve as a code base for next generation codec research. At Netflix, we decided that this was a problem we wanted to lean into. At about the same time, fortunately, Intel started developing its own open source SVT AV1 codec. So we decided to just join forces where we could each dedicate our expertise to different parts of the project. And thanks to our joint efforts, the optimizations on Intel Xeon have yielded significant quality and performance gains, making SVT AV1 ready for commercial deployment. You can expect to see AV1 adoption not only at Netflix, but from many others in 2020, thanks to the collaboration with Intel. And thank you very much. I look forward to continuing to collaborate with Netflix thank in the you. future. Thank you for being here. Now, when it comes to intelligence transforming businesses, there's perhaps no more profound change happening than in artificial intelligence. We believe that AI hardware will be a massive opportunity for the industry, a $25 billion opportunity by 2024. And at Intel, our strategy has been to provide customers with a heterogeneous set of choices to fit all of their needs, at every power level, every performance level, from the edge to the data center. And the breadth of this portfolio approach that we've taken over the last few years is what enabled us to deliver $3.5 billion in AI revenue in 2019. Last year, I announced here at CES the Intel Neural Network Processor for Inference, an entirely new class of AI chip built specifically to solve our customer inference problems. NNPI is already delivering impressive results here. Versus our competitors, we're seeing up to a 1.6x improvement on natural language processing workloads and up to a 3.7x improvement in overall system level performance. We're launching this product later this quarter and we expect the NNPI to deliver performance per watt leadership in a 75 watt power envelope. Now the AI market is obviously adapting and evolving very quickly and we're investing, as Bob mentioned, to win here. We believe it's gonna take multiple technology types to truly solve the complex problems our customers are dealing with. And to that end, last month we announced the acquisition of Habana Labs. Habana offers a programmable AI solution with a common architecture between training and inference. And we're excited about the capabilities that Habana is gonna to bring to our portfolio. We expect to see and announce exciting news about the Habana product line later this year. While dedicated AI products get a lot of the buzz in the industry, it isn't the only solution. The Intel Xeon scalable processor in many ways is the intelligence foundation for enterprises around the world. More data center AI runs on Xeon than on any other platform. In fact, Xeon is the only general purpose processor with AI built in. A few years ago, we infused AI capability into Xeon for both training and inference, starting with AVX 512 and our first generation Intel Xeon scalable processor. Last year, we continued that development and evolved by adding Intel Deep Learning Boost into the second generation Xeon Scalable. And with Deep Learning Boost, we saw an incredible 30x improvement in AI inference processing done on Xeon. And I'm happy to report that in 2019, this workload specific acceleration has helped make the second generation Xeon Scalable our fastest ramping Xeon in our history. Later this year, with our third generation Xeon Scalable, which is on track, we will be extending DL Boost with new enhancements for AI that will provide up to 60% increase in not just inference performance, but also for training performance. Last year at CES, we gave you an example of how AI on Xeon is being used for new use cases, emerging use cases that are fairly compelling and interesting. And one of the examples we gave you last year was 3D athlete tracking. We announced our intent to bring 3D athlete tracking or 3DAT to the Tokyo Olympics this year. As a reminder, 3D athlete tracking, it's a, it's a first of its kind computer vision 
a solution that uses AI to enhance the viewing experience with near real-time insight and visualization. 3DAT uses cameras to capture the athletes. It applies algorithms, and then it optimizes that solution using DL Boost to analyze the form, the motion, the biomechanics of the athletes. There's no special suits. There's no special sensors, just the data and the AI. I'm excited today to announce that this technology is going to be used uh, to provide broadcasters the ability to broadcast events like the 100 meter dash and other sprinting events at the 2020 Olympic Games. There's incredible challenges here when you think about the 100 meter dash. Uh, you have to separate the athletes from the coaches and the spectators. You have to correctly identify each of the eight athletes across multiple different camera angles. And that's all before that data is then fed into the skeletal tracking models to extract the body position, the velocity, uh, the relative position of the athlete on the track. And then all of that has to be sent to the broadcasters in under 30 seconds so that they can do the replays immediately after the event. So the second generation Xeon Scalable with DL Boost is what's going to provide the performance necessary to meet those demanding SLAs. Now the intelligence delivered by 3DAT is also being used to enhance the way the US Olympic athletes train. And instead of me telling you about this, I thought it'd be interesting to hear from a real Olympian. Uh, so to tell us about how 3DAT intelligence is transforming the way Olympic athletes are training, I'd like to welcome two-time Olympic decathlon gold medalist, Ashton Eaton. Great to see you, Ashton. Good to be here. So the decathlon, your event, yeah. 10 events. Uh, but I heard your favorite event, uh, and the one where you hold a decathlon world record, is the long jump. That's what, right. What was that world record? Uh, 27 feet, give or take a few I grains thought, of sand. I thought maybe. it'd be fun to, to show you guys what 27 feet looks like. All right. And this is how far Ashton jumped. Are you We're sure standing, that's 27? We're standing 27 feet apart. Uh, right now, so that's what he was able to do. Doesn't that <laughs> blow your mind? Um, so, so yeah. yeah. So, so Ashton, maybe you could tell the audience about what the training process is, is like for yeah. an Olympic level athlete like yourself. For sure. Yeah. Typical week, we train Monday through Saturday, and we'd spend about 20 hours doing stuff on the track. We'd spend about five hours a week doing stuff in the weight room, and then about 10 hours on recovery. So. All told, you're looking at 30, 40 hours a week on performance. So that kind of sounds like a full-time job. Definitely felt like it. <laughs> and, and speaking of jobs, uh, you're actually an Intel employee now, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. So what are you working on, and, and why, why Intel? Uh, actually, this, this last summer, Intel invited myself and a bunch of other Olympians out to Olympic Day on campus in California. And that's where I met the 3DAT project team lead. And I asked him what he was working on, and he said, well, we're working on a system that can track and analyze human motion without the need for the athletes to wear sensors. And I was like, totally shocked that was even possible. So I just started drilling him with questions. And eventually actually added, uh, invited me to the lab to see the work. And after the tour, asked if I wanted to help bring it to life. And so I saw it as an opportunity to work with a technology leader on human performance and said, absolutely. That's great. Uh, and so I understand the US Olympic team is now using 3DAT to enhance the training process. We have some video from the last training session yeah. Uh, at the Chula Vista Elite Athlete Training Center. Yeah. What benefit do you see 3DAT you know, providing to Olympic athletes? You know, I think you know, sport is so fascinating and important because it's about seeking and celebrating human potential. I think through sport, we actually answer the question, or try to answer the question, what is our species capable of? And we try to answer that by improving our performance. The way athletes do that today, well, actually, I think this technology has the capability to take us to the next level. And the reason I think that is because today, the way athletes get better is they go to a training session, they'll do a dozen or more attempts at an event, and you multiply that by five or six days a week, by a 40-week training year, and then by probably a 10-year career. You're looking at 30 to 50,000 data points on each event that they're doing. And the way the athletes improve, which is it's amazing how far we've come doing this, is largely by three factors. What they felt during the attempt, what the result was, and what the coach saw. I think that 3DAT could be the fourth factor in advancing human performance by bringing precision analysis to human motion. 
So now when an athlete runs down the runway in the long jump and tries to jump 27 feet, they'll not only know what they felt, what the result was, what the coach saw, but what every single part of their body was doing at every moment in time. And apply that over the tens of thousands of attempts an athlete will do in their career, there's an incredible amount that we're gonna learn about how to improve. And once they apply that knowledge, I think the sky's the limit. That's awesome. Well, this is really exciting stuff. Thanks yeah. for being here. My pleasure. And we'll see you around campus. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So bringing intelligent uh, insight into the way athletes train is just one way intelligence, I think, is transforming sports. Many of us also enjoy watching sports. And if you think about it, the typical sports viewing experience hasn't really changed in the last decade or maybe even in the last two decades. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is to share a little bit more about how the intelligent edge distributed computing are now helping us evolve the way sporting experience is going to be viewed. And to do that, I'd like to welcome Vice President, General Manager of Intel Sports, James Carwana, to the stage. How you doing, man? Good, Good to see you. you. We well, talked about how the experience of sports hasn't changed over the last couple decades, but we find ourselves at a time that consumer demands have greatly shifted, really evidenced by how fans create, interact, and share content experiences. So think about Snapchat, TikTok, uh, Twitch. These are platforms where fans are becoming their own producer, and they're valuing real time and interactivity. So here you have fans that are telling us how they want to interact with sports content. And what we hear the more we talk to them is that fans are looking to see the game from their own perspective, whether that's the quarterback, the wide receiver, a safety, or a referee. And the content creators are looking for the capability to share their unique insight with their followers. I mean, hell, Naveen, if, if you could sit on your couch, have a live game on the TV in front of you, be able to pick up a controller and interact with the content like it's a video game. These are the types of experiences that we're working with the sports leagues to create. So this seems pretty cool. Um, how does it all work? Well, the baseline here is really volumetric video. It's the technology platform that allows fans the capability to lean in and interact or lean back and get a personalized feed. So how it works, instead of placing cameras at a few strategic locations on a field and cutting from camera to camera to camera as in traditional production, we place cameras around the circumference of a venue. And with those cameras, we capture the visual information, not as a two-dimensional pixel, but rather as a three-dimensional voxel. And when you capture the information as a three-dimensional voxel, it gives you the capability to see the action, to show the action from any perspective on the field. And this is that, that underlying capability. So you've been at this for a few years now, right? Yeah. So tell us uh, what progress you've made. Well, we've made some pretty fantastic progress. Um, our goal is to be able to achieve high quality, cloud-based streaming volumetric video. It's, it's a mouthful. Um, and we started in 2017 with what I'll call a mid-quality, on-premise, single-frame solution. And we decided to evolve speed first, quality second, towards our goal. And I'd like to kind of walk us through that process. So in, in 2017, we could produce a volumetric frame in three minutes. And with this volumetric frame, we would create broadcast enhancements like the one you're about to see here from the NBA. You have a traditional 2D feed, you go into a volumetric frame, and from there you fly the virtual camera and see perspectives where there isn't a physical camera. Now we've been producing these, volume, these broadcast enhancements. It started out with three minutes per frame. In 2018, we sped that up by a factor of six to 30 seconds per volumetric frame. And in 2019, we made a big jump, like as you said, taking advantage of distributed computing, computing at the edge, computing in the cloud. And we sped things up by a factor of 900x. So now we can produce volumetric frames instead of 30 seconds per frame, 30 frames per second. And with that, we've achieved the world's first large-scale, cloud-based, streaming, volumetric video platform. And it was really a monumental challenge for us because we had to push computing and networking to its edge to be able to process this amount of data. 
And what I'd like to show now is the output. I think that's what we all want to see, right? And I'd like to show you what now a mid-quality cloud-based streaming volumetric video platform produces. And on a screen of this size, you'll get some pixelation, so you'll have to uh, excuse us right now with that. Cool. Let's take a look. All right. So you've got a week 15 game here. This is uh, the Cardinals and the Browns. And what you're seeing here is a virtual camera. There is no physical camera pointing at the field at this location. And this was produced in the cloud, streaming at 30 frames per second, and then the, the 2D stream came back down to Earth. And in order to do this, we had to process a ton of data. Mm -hmm. So the raw cameras produce 67 gigabytes of data per second. And that data gets pre-processed, compressed, sent up to the cloud. Once in the cloud, we spin up hundreds of machines to create the three-dimensional model. And then once we have that model, we can produce any number of streams with just a handful of additional streams, like the one that you're seeing right here. So what happens if we remove the bottlenecks of computing that you have today? What, what could you do? Well, I talked a little bit before about some of the use cases that volumetric video can attack. A fan who wants to lean in and interact with content, a fan who wants to lean back and get a personalized experience, or a content creator who's looking to share their own personal perspective to their followers. So what we could do is take our current technology capability and really map it against some of these use cases to better illustrate those, those points. Mm -hmm. So what you have here is a little GUI that we mocked up, where on the left-hand side, you see examples of various, various uh, streams that a professional or a casual producer could create. And with volumetric video, we can create infinite perspectives, any location, any position on the field. So as an example, we can show what is it like to be the quarterback during the snap. There is no camera on the quarterback. This is entirely created from our 3D model of the game. But let's say you love defense, right? What about seeing things from the safety's perspective? And let's say you want to go up a little bit higher, call it the bird's eye view camera, but again, from the defensive side, a view that you'll traditionally very rarely see. And I hope what you're seeing here is that the promise of volumetric video has in sports. We figured out the speed portion of the puzzle, now we've got to work on the quality portion of the puzzle. And that's where I think we've got to work really, really closely together, because to get from where we are at this mid-quality level to the high-quality level, we need to increase our computing by a factor of 6x, and that will allow us to go from a, a perspective of HD 20 yards from a player to a perspective of HD 6 yards from a player. So you need six times more computing power. Can you bring it? I think we can do that. All right. Thanks, Look forward James. to it. Thanks Thank for you being here. Appreciate it.